so good morning everyone this is dr shaima we continue with uh, vision so in today's class i'll be doing a uh, visual equity like and up uh, dark adaptations visual field and on also the visual reflexes so first uh, we'll start with uh, visual equity uh, now basically visual equity is defined as the ability of the eye uh, to identify two closely placed points as two distinct points the shortest distance by which two objects can be separated and still be visualized as two different objects is known as a minimum separable distance so basically visual equity expresses the resolving power of the eye that means the extent to which the eye can perceive the details and contours of an object now visual equity is a basic function of the cones and there are different tests for testing visual equity for both distant vision and near vision we'll come to all that in the coming up slides uh now to go to the second slide uh you have to know about what are the factors affecting visual equity now the factors affecting visual equ equity has been divided into three categories uh something called as the optical factors the retinal factors and also the stimulus factors now if you look at optical factors uh they basically determine the degree of visual equity and that is taken care of by structures that take part in the image forming mechanism of the eye and helps in focusing uh an object uh such as the curvature of the cornea curvature of the lens condition of the ciliary muscle and the lens ligament and also the plasticity of the lens now that was the first uh, category of factors which have we have put them under optical factors now coming to the second one we have the retinal factors where visual equity depends on the functional status of the cones and uh, if you can recollect you know that the cones are concentrated more at the fovea so visual equity will be the highest at the fovea and towards the periphery the visual equity will decrease because of this concept now the third category you have the stimulus factors uh where uh, you know the size of the object the distance of the object from the eye and the color of the object are uh, observed now the visual equity increases as the size of the object increases and distance of the object from the eye decreases that's a very important point to be kept in mind so you can see that there is an increase in visual equity as the size of the object is increasing and the distance of the object from the eye decreases now let's see what are the tests for visual equity i've already told you all that there are separate tests for distant vision and uh, there are separate for um, near vision now uh, if you look at uh, the test for uh, visual equity visual equity is tested with the help of uh, snell i'm talking about distant vision uh, so visual equity uh, for distant vision is tested with the help of snellens chart that contains rows of black capital letters against a white background and now what forms the basis or you know what forms the principle of this testing So basically the principle is the letters of the Snell's chart are designed in such a way that the width of each point of a letter subtends an angle of 1 minute at the nodal angle. So thus for any closely placed two points the minimum separable distance should draw an angle of 1 minute at the nodal angle. I think you have a picture here yeah this is what it tells. so i'll just repeat the principle now the principle of snell's chart the uh, just have a look at this uh, picture carefully the letters of the snell's chart oh, so i'll just show the snell's chart once this is a snell's chart i'll explain it in detail uh, so just have a look at this uh, this explains the principle of the snell's chart uh, the letters of the snell's chart are designed in such a way that the width of each point of a letter subtends an angle of 1 minute at the nodal angle so for any closely placed two points the minimum separable distance 
should draw an angle of 1 minute at the nodal angle. Okay. Now, have a look at the Snellen's chart. Now, uh, you know that Snellen's chart is, you know, the visual equity test for the distant vision. Now, here you can see there are rows, uh, you know, the black alphabets in a white background. And you can see that the rows are numbered as, you know, 60, 30, 36, 24, 18, 12, 9, 6 and 5 from top to bottom. And you can see that the size of the letters in each row are gradually decreasing in size. The number below each row depicts the distance in meters from which the letter can be read by a normal eye. So, you know, uh, you against the first letter alphabet T, you can see it is written as 6 by 60. So, a normal eye can read that T at 60 meters. Uh, now, the subject is asked to read the chart, the Snellen's chart, with each eye separately from a distance of 6 meters. The number denoting the lowest row which is able to read is noted. Now, now the visual equity is calculated by using the formula small d by big D where the small d is the distance at which the letters are read and big D is the distance at which letters can be read by a normal eye. For example, if a person can read by his right eye the letters designated by the number 18 the visual equity for right eye will be 18 by 6. Now, the normal visual equity is 6 by 6 for each eye. The visual equity of 6 by 5 is called supernormal, where the person can read the last row from a distance of 6 meters. So, that is about the test for distant vision. Now, we go to the, uh, the test for uh, the uh, near vision. Now, if you look at the test for near vision, uh, near the, the near point of vision is tested by the Jagger's chart. The distant vision was with Snellen's chart. Now, uh, you will be doing all this in the practical lab. Uh, now, uh, the Jagger's chart, where you ask the subject to read the ordinary, uh, whatever, you give a matter and you ask the subject to read it from ordinary reading distance. The chart contains paragraphs of different letter sizes or you know letters of different fonts. Uh, now we come to the visual field. Now the visual field uh, basically it is the area of the external world that can be seen when your gaze is fixed at a particular point and that is what you call as the visual field of the time. Now, the visual field is limited on the medial side by the bridge of the nose, superiorly by the roof of the orbit, so that the field is not circular. The visual field plotted with one eye is now known as monocular field of vision or the monocular visual field. And the visual field of both eyes overlap in the center and you call it as the binocular visual field. Now, an object present in the binocular visual field can be seen by both your eyes simultaneously. Now, each visual field is divided into medial and the lateral portion and the medial portion you call it as a na uh, the nasal part and the, the lateral portion you call it as the temporal portion. I think I will take you all to this uh, figure. Uh, now, a little more on the binocular vision. Now, when a person looks at an object with both the eyes, the light rays coming from the object stimulates both the retina. I think I will just take you all to this figure so that the understanding becomes more easier. Now, if you can look at the figure, now when a person is looking at an object with both the eyes open, the light rays coming from the object stimulate both the retinas. Now, the action potentials transmitted by the neural pathways from both the retinas get fused at the visual cortex. Now, the brain perceives them as a single image. Thus, viewing an object as a single one with both eyes is what you call as binocular vision. Now, the two points on the retinas on which the light rays from an object fall simultaneously to make binocular vision possible are known as the corresponding points. Now, for a distant object, 
the eyeballs move symmetrically and for a near object the eyeballs converge to allow the light rays to fall on corresponding points now when the light rays fall on to non corresponding points then you call it as a double vision or diplopia now we go to uh, the next topic which is visual adaptations <clears throat> Now, when you come to visual uh, adaptations, just uh, one second, I think I'll just, uh, now, so basically, uh, visual adaptations means, now the processes involved in visual adaptations can occur in the pupil. So, when you come to uh, visual adaptations, the human eye has the ability to discriminate and identify objects under a wide range of light settings or you know you can put it as illumination. Now when the light intensity changes the visual system requires some time for the eye to adapt so that it is able to see it clearly. Now the visual system employs several mechanisms that work together in extreme conditions of light either very dim light you know or very high intensity light. Now, which helps the eye to adapt to achieve optimum efficacy in that situation. Now, the process involved in visual adaptation can occur in the pupil or in the retina. When it happens in the retina, we call it as chemical and neural. Both happens in the retina or higher up in the nervous system. Now, the regulation of the pupillary size by the iris can vary light intensity by around 16 times. Now, visual adaptations can be broadly divided into two. You have the light adaptation and also the dark adaptation. Now, uh, let us see the mechanism uh, behind uh, light adaptation. Uh, so, basically light adaptation is when a person suddenly moves from a dimly lighted area to a broad daylight. Initially, the light seems very bright to you and you all, all of you all would have experienced this person any and you feel very un uncomfortable and the image appears blurred. Now, the visual system activates several mechanisms to adjust to the bright light so that vision improves after some time. Now, this is known as light adaptation. Now, light adaptation takes about 5 minutes. Now, as an immediate reaction to sudden bright light, you can see the constriction of the pupil also happening. Now, uh, let us go to the mechanism of light adaptation. Both the light adaptation and the dark adaptation, you need to know the mechanism behind it, where we are discussing them as neural adaptation and chemical adaptation. Now, here when you look at the mechanism of light uh, adaptation, the neural adaptation, uh, so basically what happens here is following a light stimulus, the sensitivity of the photoreceptors in the retina decreases which is seen in the form of decreased burst of activity to a constant stimulus. Now, the horizontal cells present, they would have a feedback inhibitory effect upon the photoreceptors. Now, even though there is an increase in light sensitivity, the amplitude of the receptor response does not rise proportionate to the intensity of light. Now, this mechanism plays a greater role in quickly bringing down the sensitivity of the photoreceptors so that light adaptation is mainly a neural phenomenon. Now, let us see uh, what is talked about under the chemical adaptation. Now, in the bright light, uh, you know that rhodopsin is rapidly converted to all trans retinal and opsin. Now, due to this bleaching, the rod responsiveness will decrease considerably as rhodopsin becomes less and less available. Now, as the rods fails to respond to the bright light, now here now cones come into picture. Now, thus with increased light intensity, intensity the rods become deactivated and what happens on the other side? The cones are getting stimulated. Now, when the rhodopsin levels really fall, might be you know around 5%, vision is taken over by the cones. Now, the image will appear less bright as cones are less sensitive to light than the roads. Now, you know that the roads are already hyperpolarized. 
there is reduced calcium influx that removes the inhibitory effect of guanyl cyclase. Now, as a result, the cyclic GMP levels is restored that increases the sensitivity of photoreceptors after some time. Now, uh, now to uh, put it in just one sentence, you have to realize now that the chemical mechanism have a lesser role in light adaptation. So, light adaptation is predominantly dominated by the neural adaptation, the chemical adaptation has got a lesser role. Now let us come to dark adaptation, light adaptation is over, we have discussed uh, the mechanic, the neural and the chemical uh, regulation of the light adaptation. Now when it comes to dark adaptation, uh, if a person stays for some time in the bright sunlight and then he moves to you know a dark room you know or a dimly light room, uh, you know that you know you, you for some time you do not see anything, there is a kind of temporary blindness which happens which you realize that after some time you know it comes back you are able to see even in, in that very dim light. Now what is happening is during this time the eye is adjusting to the low levels of illumination and that phenomenon is what we basically call as a dark adaptation. Now maximum dark adaptation occurs in about 20 minutes. Now in dim light the pupil dilates to allow the maximum possible light through the eye to have the best of the vision. Now you know how we uh, proceeded with the light adaptation, we move on with the mechanism of dark adaptation. Again here we have you know both the neural and the chemical being discussed. You know that in light adaptation neural was the predominant regulating factor, chemical did not have much role. Now let us see what happens with this. Now the neural adaptation, the first phase of adaptation occurs due to a decrease in the threshold of cones that occurs within 5 to 10 minutes. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, now this increases the retinal sensitivity to around 100 times or even still more. Now in the second phase of adaptation the rod threshold falls and the retinal sensitivity is increased to euro 1000 times. Now as the rods are more sensitive than the cones in the low levels of illumination of the darkened room. Now visceral equity you know depends mainly on the roads now you know that is about the neural regulation. Now when you come to the chemical regulation, I go to the next slide, uh, now in the dark you know uh, there is regeneration of the photopigment rhodopsin happening here that is a very important point to be remembered. Now during the exposure to bright light due to the conversion of uh, rhodopsin to all trans retinal and opsin. No rod option is available that can be activated by light. So what happens is the rods become highly insensitive to light. Now rods cannot respond completely until the rod option is restored to its resting state. Now uh, let us see this uh, picture where uh, you know the, the pathway of I, I just slightly enlarges. So you can read the heading. This is a pathway of the direct light reflex and the consensual light reflex. Now what do you mean by a light reflex? How do you differentiate this direct li uh, light reflex and the consensual light reflex? So now what happens here is uh, when the light falls on one eye, the pupils of both the eyes constrict. This is what we call as a light reflex. Now the pupillary constriction occurring in the stimulated eye that is where exactly I am putting the light, the constriction happening there you call it as a direct light reflex and the constriction happening in the other eye you call it as a consensual light reflex. Now here uh, for the light reflex there are two pathways, you call it as the efferent pathway and the efferent pathway. I will just slightly enlarge the figure. So you can see it here, the light is shown to one eye through the optic nerve, the optic tract. It reaches the pretectal nuclei and the superior colliculi, that is a first order neuron that holds set. Now from the pretectal nu uh, 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 pre tectal nuclei and the superior colliculi, you have the second side set of fiber neurons arising which is carrying the sensation. You have the second order neurons arising, one branch you know which goes to the Edinger-Westphal nucleus. 
Through the ocular motor nerve, it reaches the ciliary ganglion. Through the short ciliary nerve, it reaches the sphincter pupillae. And what happens is pupillary constriction occurs and that is a direct light reflex. On the right hand side, you can see that the information which is being uh, carried from the pretectal nuclei and the superior colliculi through the second order neuron it arises or it causes the activation of edinger westphal nucleus which is on the other side that is why you put it as contralateral edinger westphal nucleus. It is the same then through the ocular motor nerve it reaches the ciliary ganglion through the short ciliary nerve it reaches the sphincter pupillae and finally uh, the pupil of the eye on the other side constriction happens and that is concentral light reflex. Now, uh, I think we go to the, the next slide. So, I think I have just uh, the coming up slides both the direct light reflex and the indirect li uh, light reflex. I have just put it under you know two pathway the efferent pathway and the efferent pathway. I think you can just go through that. Now, I will take you all to the accommodation reflex. Now, when you look at accommodation reflex, the pupils of both the eyes constrict on looking at a near object. Now, this is what you call as the accommodation reflex. Now, the accommodation pathway, let me just see if there is a figure. Yeah, yeah, you have a beautiful figure here. Uh, so, you can see that when your gaze is fixed from far object immediately to a near object, sensations pass through the visual pathway, it reaches the visual cortex area number 17. Through the occipital mesencephalic pathway, it reaches the Edinger Westphal nucleus. Through the occipital mesencephalic pathway, it reaches through the ocular motor nerve. It causes contra uh, contraction of ciliary muscle, sphincter pupillae and medial rectus muscle, which increases the convexity of the lens, constriction of the pupil and also the medial rotation of the eyeball. Now, this pathway of accommodation reflex when I categorize them into the efferent pathway and the efferent pathway. Now, the efferent pathway is the first order neurons from the retinal ganglion cells which projects to the lateral geniculate body. Now, from the lateral geniculate body, you have the second order neurons arising that projects to area number 17. I am just explaining this with a little more detail. So, efferent pathway, the first order neurons from the retinal ganglion cells reaches the lateral geniculate body. From the lateral geniculate body, second order neuron starts and projects to area number 17 which is the visual cortex from where the third order neurons start and proceed to the edinger westphal nucleus. So, till there is the efferent pathway. Now, the efferent pathway from the striator cortex via the occipital mesencephalic pathway impulse travels to the ocular motor nerve nucleus and then it reaches the sphincter pupillae, ciliary muscle and the medial rectus finally causing the accommodation reflex or, or what does it cause? It increases the convexity of the lens, constriction of the pupil and medial rotation of the eye. So, that is about the accommodation uh, reflex. Now, we go to the last slide of the topic uh, which is the Agile Robertson pupil. Now, uh, what do you mean by an Agile Robertson pupil? It is basically, I have just put the definition in a small font size there. Uh, they are actually bilateral small pupils that reduce in size when the patient focuses on a near object, but do not constrict when exposed to bright light. I will just explain a little more. Now, in neurological lesions which occurs in the pretectal superior colliculi region of the mesencephalon, the fibers mediating the light reflex are getting damaged. You need to uh, be very thorough with this topic. It is a very often asked three marker, the Agile Robertson pupil. So, I just repeated the neurological regions which are happening in the mesencephalon. Exactly where in the mesencephalon? The pretectal superior colliculi. What happens then is the fibers which is taking care of the light reflex are getting damaged. This is a classical pupillary abnormality in neurosyphilis. But these days, uh, you do not see it much these days because syphilis can, uh, uh, you know, can be effectively treated at a very early stage. Now, here the light reflexes, both the direct light, light reflex and the consensual or the indirect light reflex are lost in Agile Robertson people. But 
there is persistence of the accommodation reflex because the fibers for accommodation reflex take a different course. It is not passing through the uh, you know mesencephalon or through the pretectal superior colliculi. So, in this particular condition, in the in this neurological condition, the accommodation reflex the pathway is escaping. Uh, so, I think uh, uh, I would be doing one more class with you all. I think they uh, will do uh, color vision. I think with that we uh, wind up with vision. So, thank you everyone for listening to the class. Uh, so, I repeat once again, uh, please be very thorough with uh, special senses because a lot of marks come for your, for your university exam for these chapters. Initially, first time when you listen to the classes, it may appear a little tough to you all, but I think 3-4 revisions with notes made, you know, would solve the problem. And I think I have uh, made uh, the PPTs in such a way that, you know, you need not refer anything else. Uh, just, uh, you know, don't try to exclude because I have already, you know, really briefed up points for you all. So, please don't try to go down from that. Uh, I think if you put it exactly like this, with the diagrams included, you would score really well with vision. So, bye uh, kids, uh, see you all in the next class with color vision.